All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Round two of the hybrid series today. Today's gonna, this, uh, this session's going to be a little bit more about uh, you know, what's new in hybrid, what's coming, uh, some, some more tips about uh, migration issues you are going to run into and, and how to make sure that you get the smoothest onboarding experience. Um, and uh, I, I'm introduced myself. For those who don't know, I'm uh, Timothy Heaney. I'm a supportability program manager on the exchange team, responsible for hybrid and onboarding and migration. And my name is uh, Michael van Horenbeek, but for non-native Dutch speakers, I'm better known as Van Hybrid because I do a lot of the hybrid stuff. Um, I used to be an exchange MVP, and now they call that office server and services. And I used to tell Tim that I'm typically here to keep him honest, but you'll find out that he doesn't need that. So. And I've been told we look like convicts. I can assure you that we've done <laughs> nothing recently. Uh, and thank you for your honesty. Um, anyway, <laughs> all right. So some of these slides in the beginning we'll go through pretty quickly, but because uh, a lot of people know um, why you would choose hybrid. Um, but anyway, I think it's worth, worth just making sure everybody's on the same page. When you're migrating from on-premises to Office 365, you, know, you want to make sure that as you're moving users to Office 365, their experience, they don't really know that they've been moved. You want to make sure that their Outlook profiles just reconnect. You want to make sure that they can see Free Busy. If they open up a calendar invite and add attendees, they can just see Free Busy. If you, you know, sometimes if you're in an enterprise organization, you'll, have, you'll look at your gal, you'll be able to see the titles of the people that you're t communicating with. Instead of looking and seeing things like uh, contact cards, not seeing free busy, and at, seeing it like as if it was coming, emails were coming from an external recipient, that wouldn't be a good experience if you moved your users to the cloud and you lost all of those features, okay? Especially if you were going to be in hybrid for the long haul, if you were going to run it for a couple of months or potentially even years, you would not want to not be able to access free busy. Um, so instead of seeing the no free busy and the contact card and things like that, you would see the gal card and have basically a rich experience. We talked earlier about a lot of the things you won't get. So a lot of people left that session saying, hell with this, I ain't going hybrid. Well, hopefully this will change your mind and you'll, you'll see that there is a lot of good stuff. We just, you know, we. We like to talk about the bad stuff because it's more interesting, right? TMZ style. All right, so there is <laughs> the other thing you get is uh, this is the only um, a hybrid is the only option you have for actually um, offboarding a mailbox. So if you want to move a mailbox with our native tools, if you want to move a mailbox from on premises back to Office 365, you've had enough of this, you're getting them off, you can use uh, hybrid uh, to actually move them off so that you always have that option. Of course, there's third-party tools that can do it for you, but the only native tool is this. There's no other cutover migration, stage migration. None of that stuff allows you to, none of the other migration options allow you to offboard um, a mailbox. Again, some of the things you get, uh, Free Busy just works. You move a mailbox to the cloud, Free Busy continues to work. Um, things like cross-premises e-discovery, if you use that, um, that just continues to work, assuming you're at least Exchange 2013 or, or greater. Um, those, these types of things just seamlessly keep going and working. And we keep adding more features. You might have been in some sessions earlier from some, a few other speakers that talked about you know, um, using Evo STS to connect into on-prem mailboxes. There's all kinds of nifty new things we're doing that uh, we're adding to the hybrid space as time goes. The hybrid wizard history, uh, for those of you, how many have done the 72-page uh, documentation on configuring hybrid? I, every time I do that, there's a few hands. Every time I ask that question, a few hands go up. And it was, it was awful for people. They had a group of masters, exchange masters, in front of me. And they went through, at that time, it was 70 pages of content and couldn't get it configured. We were missing the last two pages. Um, we finally got those and then created a wizard for it because it was darn near impossible. Uh, that was introduced in Exchange 2010, SP2, so quite a ways back. Um, my clicker is not working. All right, now I'm clicking too fast. In Exchange 2013, we had the um, we up updated a, a lot of our transport options because we initially we thought everybody did transport in one way, and then we found out that that was not the case. Um, so we had to light up a whole bunch of extra ways to do transport, including edge transport and things like that. Um, eventually, in CU5, we started to light uh, up the options to have. Uh, um, 
the hybrid wizard in uh, 21 Vianet in Gallatin. And then we updated it to be uh, a new application in Office 365 about a year ago. When we came out with this new hybrid application, that's when we took, uh, we took a step in the direction of actually being able to understand the customer experience while they're running hybrid. Up until then, we put the product out there. We had no insights into the product. And we just said, yep, it works. And we dropped the mic. Uh, we did a little investigation and found out that might not have been true. But we were cool with just saying it worked, right? Um, next thing, then uh, the last thing we did, uh, the next thing we did was we introduced the hybrid wizard into Exchange 2010 because 45% of our new hybrid deployments this last month came from Exchange 2010. So if we didn't do it for 2010, we were not solving the problem for our customer. So we introduced 2010 into the new hybrid application so that we didn't have to ignore those customers. Then we ran out of space, so we moved all the stuff over, and we have more options. Now, what we, you might have noticed about a month ago, we, uh, or so, a month or two ago, we announced that there was a new um, option in the hybrid configuration wizard for a minimal hybrid configuration. What this does is it allows you, let's say you're a 500-seat customer, 150-seat customer, it allows you to use MRS-based migration, so you can move your mailboxes without having to reconnect Outlook you can still offboard your mailboxes. You get all the migration and administration flexibility of um, hybrid, but you don't have to, it doesn't go through the free busy configuration and enhance the mail flow configuration, so it's a much more simplified environment. Think of it as a new way to do a cutover migration. We added that to the um, hybrid wizard about a month and a half, two months ago, sometime in July. And then what we're doing now, which we're gonna talk about a little bit, uh, it's coming out, um, should be coming out this weekend, is end-to-end uh, -end onboarding, where we're going to have a new MRS-based experience in uh, the new portal, MRS-based migration experience in the portal, and we're going to allow for a one-time AAD sync, so that instead of provisioning users the old-fashioned way with, if you were doing a cutover migration, which is like an Outlook Anywhere-based migration that goes in and grabs all your users and provisions them, and then you have to recreate all the Outlook profiles if you were a smaller company, Instead of having to do that, you'll be able to go through uh, the minimal hybrid experience with a one-time AAD sync, AAD Connect sync, and then it will disable AAD Connect and you'll be able to cut over. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Now, what are the benefits of this new hybrid application? One of the benefits is, well, first of all, we can see everything that happens when you run the hybrid app. We know if you hit the back button, the forward button, we know how long it took you to hit the button, we know how long it took that next page to render. There was times in the hybrid wizard in the old experience and the new experience where it took eight to 12 hours for a page to render. But remember, we had no insights into that. We dropped the mic. So we were like, yeah, we're good, right? As soon as we started getting a telemetry on this, we said, oh, shoot. Well, we can fix that. So we just started fixing things because we started to see what the experiences were like. Now, with the old model, if we wanted to fix something, we would have to wait for a CU update to fix it. Okay? With the new model, we can now, we've deployed a new hybrid app as much as four or five times a week. If we put a fix in there, we just put it out. We test it and then put it out, right? We test it. We, we put it out, then we test it. I mean, we test it. So basically, when we first put the hybrid app out, we actually had a problem that cost 40% of our, uh, uh, the September, right around the 15th of last year, we put the hybrid app out. As soon as we put it out, we had two separate errors that were causing over 40% of our hybrid runs to fail. This is something that if we did it on premises, it would have taken us six months to solve. What we did was we got the telemetry immediately, and we saw that it was causing all these failures. We had the logs uploaded to the service, so we were able to detect what went wrong with these um, configurations. We found that issue on Monday. We weren't really working over the weekend. Apparently, they need new batteries. I'm just going to click through the whole thing. Uh, we found the issue on Monday. After we found the issue, we put it in code on Tuesday, and it was released on Wednesday. We didn't get any calls on the support, and we took two days to solve a problem that would have probably taken three to six months to solve, if we ever even detected the problem, right? So this is, this is the benefit and the power of using this new hybrid application. We get the telemetry we need to understand the customer experience, and we solve the problems super quick. People just thought it was a, a glitch because they reran the wizard a couple days later. They got pissed off, went home, came back the next day, ran the wizard, and then it was, it was fixed. 
Um, some of the, I'm going to go through this one because it's not that important, but some of the impacts we've seen from this is we've seen our failure rate, the, the one on the upper right I think is the most relevant. We've seen our failure rate go from 40% on first run to 1%. Okay? So that means that we've had, I mean, a, a significant decrease in issues. And now when we fix issues, we basically say, oh, three people ran into this. It isn't that 10% of people ran into this anymore. We're now fixing one and two, one off, two off issues type things. Um, some of the other things we made better. Uh, have you ever ran, the, how many people ran the old hybrid wizard, whether it be 2013 or 2010 and had an error? Okay, I'm surprised there's not more hands. It, the error um, that I'm showing you up there, the one on the left, is the old error message. Now, when I say the old error message, I'm talking about from one year ago. We've had the hybrid wizard for about four or five years. One year ago, that was the error message. Completely useless error message, okay? The new error message on the right does everything from showing you what the error is to giving you a solution link to it and providing you with the ability to open PowerShell so you could take care of the problem immediately, okay? So it's just making the error experience a lot better. In addition, we've done things like people have asked, what changes did you do to my connector when you ran the hybrid wizard? What we have in the logs now is we have uh, tables in the logs. The tables are there for two reasons. They're there for machine learning purposes, but they're also there to be able to, uh, for you to be able to go in and see what changes we made. What we have is we have an actual column and an ex uh, expected column in the logs. The actual is what your current settings are, and the expected is what we're about to change them to. So if you come in and say, the hybrid wizard broke my mail flow, you can go back through your log, see what we changed, and change it back. There's no undo button, in case you were wondering. Um, another um, feature we've added, because feedback is pretty darn important to us, another feature we've added is the ability to provide feedback directly in the application and to cancel the application. 20% of our runs were ending in a cancel at one point. And we were trying to figure out why, so we added an experience to actually be able to select the reason you were canceling. Um, and what we do is when uh, a customer selects a reason for canceling the experience, we, they select the reason from a dropdown, give verbatim, and then they get contacted, not necessarily every customer, but a lot of customers get contacted by a, a support group to find out if there's anything we could do to improve the experience. This is something we implemented probably about a month ago, and, or two months ago, and we've already had, I think, about 12 fixes in the product because of it. So it's been somewhat successful, and we've, we've been able to decrease the cancels in the experience because of it. Um, some feedback we get, we get feedback on every page of the app. We always ask for feedback. We want to know what you think. We want to be able to improve the experience. I was talking to somebody yesterday that um, mentioned that they, they, they sent feedback into the app, and he said, I didn't have a scroll bar for the domains because he was adding like 60-some domains to, to the hybrid wizard. I didn't have a scroll bar, so I couldn't add more domains. But when I did testing, I tested with two domains because I was like, all right, good enough, right? It worked. Um, so as soon as I saw that feedback, he actually just told me about it yesterday. I sent this feedback, and I said, oh, you're the guy with 64 domains. And he said, no, 67. So I was wrong, <laughs> but, but I read his feedback. And his feedback led to not only us handling the multiple domain scenario better, but us taking a look at that scenario end to end and fixing some of the TXT experience for it, some of the, co all the different issues that you would run into with the multiple domains. I realized then I needed to do 67 domains and then I was able to, so it was great getting that feedback and, and I, we read every piece of it. And some of it's fun to read, like these, because you get, you know, I like the simplicity of it and all this stuff. Um, if anybody doesn't like vulgar language, you may want to look away for a minute, because some of it's not so good, okay? Um, some people wanted to see our developers <laughs> beheaded. Uh, some people really did not. And some of it was like, I mean, if you think about, never mind. Yeah. Anyway, keep the, <laughs> keep the feedback coming. Um, we read it all. I went to the developers. They did not want to do the video, so we did not do the video. <laughs> so what else are we doing in the hybrid wizard? We're automating all the prerequisites, right? Um, what do I mean by that? So there's, there's a whole bunch of things that you have to do in the hybrid wizard. 
You have to choose the right migration option before you get to the hybrid wizard. Do you even need hybrid, right? So what we're trying to do in the hybrid wizard is we're trying to get you to the right migration option. That's some of the things we're starting to build into it. If hybrid's not right for you, we want to get you away from it, and we want to get you to another option. If it is right for you, maybe the minimal one that we talked about earlier is the one for you. Um, addressing prerequisites like enabling DirSync. We need you to activate DirSync before you run the hybrid wizard. Again, that used to be a separate experience. You'd have to go to the portal and go to the right section and activate DirSync. Doesn't sound like a lot, but when you start adding up all these prerequisites, we made an awesome hybrid experience that was surrounded by a bunch of stuff that you had to do. Right? What we're trying to do is bridge that gap and take away all this stuff and put it in one seamless experience. Okay? Um, and then remove the need to rerun the hybrid wizard. It just really sucks when you have to run the hybrid wizard multiple times. When we first started with the new hybrid app, we had telemetry. You know, as of a year ago, we had telemetry for it. The average customer ran 3.2 times, which is really hard to do, but they ran 3.2 times. They now run 1.4, I think it is, so it's, it's going down pretty dramatically. Um, the other thing we do is if you don't have an external URL specified, that's, these are things that we started to build into the wizard. If you're missing things in on-premises, rather than giving you an error, we either try to self-heal or we try to give you an opportunity to fix it directly in the wizard. Okay? Things like a missing external, I'm just giving you a few examples. Things like the missing external URL for EWS, you need that for free busy. So if it's not there in the wizard, instead of giving you an error saying, go set it, we're going to try to get you to fix it right there in the wizard. Uh, one of the things we started recently doing is manually creating your migration endpoint. It's one of the things that you would have to do separately before. So now when you run through the wizard, we actually make an attempt at creating a migration endpoint for you. If it does not create, uh, if it doesn't successfully create, it, you'll have chances later in the experience to do it, but we try our best to do it. We do a test, e uh, test migration server availability command as well to make sure that we successfully created the migration endpoint and we give you that stat, those stats in the log. So you can go to the migration log to figure out why that migration endpoint was not created successfully if it failed. Um, yeah, and that's the, if the migration endpoint doesn't create, we just give you a warning saying it didn't create. Uh, one, another thing we do is we, like I said, we activate DirSync for you automatically. So rather than you having to go to separate wizards and stuff, DirSync's activated for you. This is, uh, one of the things we're trying to do is get rid of, and this is not there yet, but we're trying to get rid of these pages. We've improved these pages a lot so that you can know, uh, do like multiple TXT records and start adding them for the, federation, for the purpose of federation, but it's really challenging sometimes to get past this screen. You have to go to your external DNS and prove you own a domain that you already proved you owned. You went to the portal and said, I own Contosa.com. And then you can add that domain to the portal, right? And then you come into the hybrid app, and we say, oh, for federation, you need to prove you own the domain. You didn't believe me the first time? Right? That's kind of silly. The reason for that is we used to have a separate all system for federation and for identity. Well, that's no longer the case, but we never updated our code to respect it. So what we're, doing, what we're working on now is we're working on updating our code to respect it. It's not out yet, but we're working on that. Until then, we've improved the screens to do as much as we can to make it easy for you. But anytime you have DNS and federation in the same sentence, it's typically not easy. So. Uh, HCW, we updated it to work for how many? Do we have any uh, dedicated or VNX customers in here? OK, you don't care? Move on. <laughs> uh, how many people use multi-factor authentication? Okay, and uh, how many people have used PowerShell for Exchange with multi-factor authentication? It's a trick question, right? It doesn't work. Um, well, there might be a few people that have a early access to things, but it doesn't really work. One of the things we're doing is, and we're incorporating into the hybrid wizard as well in the next few months, uh, maybe sooner, is we're gonna have a new PowerShell module that you can download that will allow you to connect using MFA, uh, multi-factor authentication, to Exchange Online PowerShell. We could never use Remote PowerShell with MFA, so that meant your admin account couldn't connect to Remote PowerShell, which meant the hybrid app couldn't connect with Remote PowerShell. So what we're doing now is we're uh, working on, this isn't out yet, but we're working on the ability to do multi-factor authentication um, uh, through uh, the hybrid configuration wizard. Now, um, obviously, I'm, I'm too scared to do live demos on stage. So that's why I recorded these things. But this is a live application that I was using. And you can see it's already working. 
and it connected to my lab. And Get Mailbox is going to run in a second, and you'll see that it uh, is able to connect and download, uh, uh, or able to connect and retrieve a list of mailboxes. So we are very close to having this integration into the hybrid app, and very close to um, delivering a PowerShell that supports MFA so that you can do that for your customers. Minimal hybrid configuration, we talked about this a little bit, but I'll kind of go through quickly because we've already kind of covered it. Some hybrid, sometimes hybrid is just too much, okay? You don't need free busy. Your plan is to move your 300 users all at one time, you're helping a customer move 300 users all at one time, and when I say all at one time, it might be over two, three weeks a month, right? So you're moving your users fairly quickly. So you don't need necessarily full hybrid. You don't need free busy if it's a couple weeks. You can talk to your users and probably get them to be okay without having some of these features, okay? So what do you do? Do you go cut over? Well, if you go cut over migration, all of a sudden you, uh, you, you have to recreate everybody's Outlook profile. You have to somehow get them a new username and password. Their passwords don't stay in sync. All these things start to get in the way of things, right? So sometimes, cutover is a fine migration option in certain cases, but sometimes it's not good enough, right? It's not good enough for the user. It's easy for the admin, it's not good enough for the user sometimes, okay? <clears throat> There's, um, sometimes you don't need all the confusing mail flow options that we have in the hybrid um, application. Uh, you don't want to manually manage passwords, like I said, post-it notes and handing them out to all your users is kind of a pain. You could text them their password. It's not easy, so just doing AAD Connect with password sync and then doing a minimal hybrid and moving just their mailboxes can sometimes be a better approach. Um, and you know, planning and migrating over the course of a month is who this is for. If you are preparing to migrate over the course of six months to a year, you probably want to go full hybrid. The idea is this is a great way to do a big bang migration without all the pain of cutover. That's the way basically we're positioning it. Um, how, to, how we determine the recommended approach, when you're going through the hybrid wizard today, we'll, we'll allow you to pick whichever options you want, but we'll try to guide you to the right approach, okay? What we think is the right approach. And nobody's gonna agree with the way that I determine the right approach, and that's fine. We could tweak it over time, okay? Um, but basically, we look to see if you already have hybrid configured. If you already have hybrid configured, we are not gonna offer you minimal hybrid. You've already made your decision, so you won't even see the screen, okay? If you have um, 10 exchange servers or more, or over 150 <coughs> mailboxes, you will see the option for minimal hybrid, but we will not have it as recommended, okay? Because at some point, it just becomes too much, and you'll want to go full hybrid. Um, you know, we could talk about if we should use a different measure, and then we also look at, do you have AAD Connect installed already, okay? The reason we look for that is to see if, um, if you don't have AAD Connect installed, if you have not synchronized your users yet, we will provide you with an option to synchronize your users one time if you want to. And depending on the size of your organization, we will um, either make it recommended or not recommended. What this will do is it will synchronize your users one time. It will download and install AAD Connect as part of the hybrid app. You'll go through the configuration of AAD Connect. You'll be guided through that. And then I have some screenshots of it. And then it will go and disable AAD Connect and deactivate it in the service, essentially giving you a one-time sync of your users. And then you'll be able to do your migration using a new MRS pane that I'm also going to show here. So. Configuring hybrid, using minimal hybrid configuration. When you're going through the, uh, the experience, you basically download the hybrid configuration app. It will automatically detect your on-premises exchange server inversion and do some additional detections of your on-premises environment. It'll ask you for your on-premises username and password as well as your cloud uh, username and password. You'll provide those. Um, it's important to provide your on-premises password rather than using the, the currently signed in credentials if you want the migration endpoint created for you. Because um, we, we don't want to do anything that you know, compromises your system, so we have to ask you to provide your password. After you provide your password, we then do a detection of what we should offer you. You would select minimal hybrid configuration and then update. Okay. Like I said, don't blink because this is like the fastest configuration that you'll ever do. Um, it, may, it takes away almost every screen because all the screens in the hybrid wizard that are confusing, almost all of them, are related to mail flow. But we're not configuring mail flow. Mail flow is going to work while you're doing an MRS migration. It just won't have that authenticated mail. 
and we don't configure your TXT record for uh, Federation. So it's a really simple, clean experience for that a, a small to medium customer could run through with very, very lo little turbulence is kind of the idea. So what's configured? We could figure a lot of stuff. We could figure your accepted domain, your remote domains. We update your email address policy. All the things that are configured in a hybrid configuration minus your connectors and your org relationship and OAuth settings. So we still have to configure your email address policy so mail routing can work. We still have to configure your accepted domains, your remote domains. We have to hydrate your tenant. All the things that um, the hybrid app normally does is done, but you, it's all done under the hood. You don't have to do all this stuff manually. Um, it's a lot of the stuff um, the Fast Track Center used to offer something like this in the form of what they called simple MRS. Um, this is basically an automated way of doing that. Um, so what's missing? You don't get free busy. You don't get OWA and Active Sync redirection. Okay, so I don't know how important that is to people, but you don't get that. Authenticated mail, because the reason why is OWA and ActiveSync redirection rely on uh, organization relationships, so you wouldn't get that. Authenticated mail flow, you wouldn't get that. You would still get mail flow, but not authenticated mail flow. Cross-premises e-discovery relies on OAuth, so you wouldn't be able to do a discovery search. And automatic retention for archives. These are the types of features that you would not get. If you were doing a quick migration, it probably wouldn't matter. But if it does, then do full hybrid. It's still an option. So um, when are you going to use the minimal hybrid configuration? Um, just a quick question. Who was at the session this morning uh, from Nicholas and Timothy as well about hybrid and long term? OK. Quite a few of you. So um, Nicholas and Timothy, uh, they talked about a multi-forest hybrid deployment. Um, and there are some valid reasons where this could come in really handy, because a full-blown hybrid deployment has its complexities, right? Um, so the minimal hybrid configuration takes away a lot of that complexity, and it's much quicker to run through and to implement and to get some certain value out of it. So um, probably need to get move closer over here. Um, if you're only using hybrid as a migration vehicle, literally just I want to get from A to B, I want to do that as quickly as possible, and I don't necessarily care much um, of the end user experience. And um, I don't mean that in a bad way, though. Uh, it's not that you don't care at all. But as uh, Timothy said, you're not getting the free busy. You're not getting the authenticated mail flow, which means that you know, if you've got two colleagues mailing one another, uh, what they will experience in, for instance, Outlook is going to be a little bit different. But it does allow you to get started really, really quickly. Um, and it does answer to the most common question I hear for migrations, and one of the reasons why most organizations that move to Office 365, at least in my experience, are using hybrid, is in order to preserve that OST file. So if you move to Office 365, the last thing you want to do is uh, rebuild those Outlook profiles, because that means interacting with end users. And you know, they can be pesky sometimes. Um, so if you can avoid having to recreate the profile, update the profile, having to interact them, troubleshoot the issues that you might have, that is a good thing. So the MRS move, or the hybrid mailbox move, will actually give that. Uh, secondly, and Timothy just alluded to it, it is a supported way to do that, because could you have done a similar thing in the past without the simple um, or the minimal hybrid configuration? Yes, of course. It has been working for a while. It's a simple MRS that he was referring to, but technically it was not really supported unless Microsoft did it. Um, so that you know, kind of brings you in a catch-22 that you wanted to do it but couldn't do it. So this is one of the reasons why you definitely want to use that. Um, one of the use cases is merger and acquisitions. Um, typically, Company A is already using Exchange, perhaps uh, Exchange Hybrid or Office 365, and now you merge with another organization, you buy another organization, and you want to get them into your tenant as quickly as possible. And there is many ways that you can do that. Sometimes it means you know, reaching out to third-party tools. Um, but this is actually a really neat way to do that. And the best way to illustrate it is, is probably to go through an example. So um, scenario here is we've got a company called Belgian Waffle House, and you know I couldn't come up with a better name, and another company called Belgian Chocolate House. And they decided that you know, a joint venture, a merger, is a good thing because that allows them to create these good cupcakes, chocolate cupcakes. Um, so management said, we bought this company and we want to do something with it. And here are some requirements to you, IT. 
first of all, we want you to set up a single global collaboration environment uh, in Office 365. And we want you to do that as quickly as possible. So we signed the paperwork yesterday. And tomorrow, if possible, we would very much like to start working with them. right? Um, if you could do that retroactively so that we could have done it yesterday, that would even be better. Um, and then while your edit is you know, as if you didn't have anything else to do, then please use the low-hanging fruit to show us some value right away, because you know, this, uh, this acquisition was really, really expensive. Um, so we really want to get the value right away so that we can go back to the business and show them, look what we've done. Look what you've, you know, the money that you're spending buying that company. This is what you're getting out of it. So um, scenario here on the left-hand side, Belgian Waffle House, and they bought the chocolate house. So first of all, you buy the company. That's not anything that IT does. But what do you do then? What is the next step that you do? And I'm going to take the high-level steps. There might be some additional tasks that are uh, intertwined a little bit here. But essentially, you want to make sure that the identities of the company that you just bought, that you're bringing in into your tenant, are being synchronized to Office 365. Um, using Azure AD Connect, this is really easy to do. You just set up a new source uh, on-premises Active Directory environment and have it sync to Office 365. Now, it, it sounds really easy. It is. But of course, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If the environment that you just inherited is not really you know, up to par, uh, basically it's a mess, then you ju don't just want to synchronize it over. So there is some sanity or sanitizing that you have to do on that environment. But you know, given that everything is in order, you can synchronize those identities to your tenant, and they will be living there. Now, Previously, one of the options that you, had to, um, that you had to move those mailboxes is use a third-party tool and get them into your tenant, or do a double hop migration, meaning I'm going to take those users out of their environment, potentially even um, um, you know, an older version of Exchange. I'm going to move them over to my on-premises Exchange organization, and then through my hybrid deployment, I'm going to move them over to Office 365. It works really well, but it is a double hop, meaning twice the effort that you have to go through. Using the simple MRS, you can actually leverage their environment, provided that they're on Exchange, run the simple MRS wizard there. Because um, do you need the coexistence? Yes. It was one of the requirements that you know, the business gave you and said, well, we want to collaborate with them. So yes, we want to see their free busy. Yes, we want to be able to email with them. But in all things considered, you've been two separate companies. So chances are that you did not have free busy already, that you did not have that authenticated email already. So why would you want to set that up and then make your life harder, make it take longer to set up hybrid? So you use a simple MRS, um, or sorry, the minimal hybrid configuration wizard, wow, um, to move the mailboxes to Office 365. Um, and how that works, we're going to see that later in detail. But basically, through a migration endpoint, a connection is made into that other forest, from your tenant to that other forest. Mailboxes are moved to Office 365. And all in all, at the end, everybody is happy. So that is you know, five minutes work. Business comes to you, and five minutes later, you're up and running. And you can start moving mailboxes. With this being said, Tim? I'm not on. All right, he called it minimal hybrid quite a few times. Oh, he called it uh, simple MRS quite a few I times. I know, I know. Minimal. I'm sorry. It's OK. All right, so what's next for hybrid? One of the things you, uh, I, I've only showed this one time at a Tech Ready event, which is our internal event. Uh, one of the things that you, you th I think you, I've alluded to a few times here is that feedback is super important to us. And uh, we don't get feedback from enough customers. We get feedback from, uh, to be exact, 17% of our customers. Okay, So it's, that's a lot. But we want feedback from more. And we also want to understand what it, what's going on you know, if, if we're raising your heart rate. If we're making you feel, you know, any pressure or tension while you're um, while you're going through the hybrid configuration, so we have an automated way. It's not true, but we do have Hololens <laughs> where we can help you get through hybrid. That's not true either. All right. So now that you're all excited about these features, um, what's really coming? Uh, like I talked about this earlier, but we have uh, end to end migration experience that's a little bit messy. You know, first thing you need to do is add and verify your domain in the service before you can do any migration approach. 
And then you have to determine the migration approach you want to do, cut over stage, hybrid, whatever it is, right, third party. Then you have to determine, uh, configure the source environment. This is the one step where the hybrid configuration wizard comes in, and we help you along with that, uh, if you're going hybrid. Then you go through the provisioning of your users. This could be in a slightly different order depending on the migration approach, but you get the idea. There's a whole lot of steps you have to do before and after migration, um, before and after hybrid to get onboarded, okay? Even this start migration batch, there's eight steps here. If you were to expand any of these eight steps, there's no less than 10 steps in each of these. So there you go, you're talking about 80 steps, right? It's a lot of steps to do a migration, not simple stuff. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to make this, we're trying to string all these things together and make it as seamless as possible so that we can get you to the right migration approach and so that we can um, uh, you know, configure everything you need before the hybrid wizard and after in one seamless experience. So one of the things that's coming in the new portal is there's going to be a migration option for um, Exchange, okay, for Exchange 2010 and greater, 2010, 13, and 16. When you select that option, you're going to go in there and select your migration source. This is technically a mock-up, but it's um, running in a test environment right now, so it's going to be available very soon. You're going to walk through, uh, I'll walk you through the experience here in a minute, but basically it'll walk through, it'll configure your directory synchronization for you, it'll download AAD Connect if you select that option, it will go through that end-to-end -end experience as much as we possibly can right now. It's something that we're going to iterate on and make it better and better, but this is our first go at kind of stringing the rest of the stuff together, and that's what we're trying to do here. So what's it going to look like? If I can ever click. You're going to select the Exchange Migration option. Once you select the Exchange Migration option, it will do an evaluation in your environment to see if you ran the new hybrid app. If you have not run the new hybrid app, it will take you to a, um, a download page to run the new hybrid application. Assuming you picked minimal hybrid, I already kind of showed a demo of this earlier. You would pick your minimal hybrid options or full hybrid options. Whatever it is, you would run through the hybrid wizard as it's, as it's constituted today. Once you get through the pages that are there today, there would be new options that show up. Now, these are not final views of this. It's actually been updated from this, but this is just an idea of what it's going to look like, where it'll ask if you want to do one-time sync or if you want to install AAD Connect on your own separately. That recommended thing that's uh, showing there, or not showing there, we will show recommended if, um, if you're under 150 seats. If you're not, if you're over 150 seats, we won't show anything. You'll be able to pick whichever option you want. We will not make a recommendation. After you click the next option, let's assume that you pick the option that I want to install AAD Connect. We're going to let you know what you're going to need to do, and we're going to kind of download the hybrid application in the background while you're looking at what you need to do. Once you go step through the, the, it'll step you through five screens in the AAD Connect wizard, and then it'll run through and wait for the synchronization of users to complete. Once the synchronization of users is complete, it will then um, take you to an ending page where you can give us feedback that we will read. And I might share on stage if you make it funny. Um, and then we take you back to the migration pane. There's, how many people have used the IMAP migration pane that we have in the portal today, the new portal? Okay, so we're building more experiences based on that look and feel. It's not exactly that experience, but it's based on that look and feel. Okay, this is an MRS-based experience, though. Um, we're going to build, uh, we're going to send you directly back to the, migra to the portal page for, to do an MRS-based migration where you'll be able to select your users and then start the migration. The beautiful thing about this is, Today, we, don't have, we have a lot of telemetry on migrations, but we don't understand the tenant end to end. This is going to allow us to have the telemetry from the hybrid wizard all the way through to the migration, to the prerequisites about that tenant so that we can understand the experience they had end to end and allow us to do things like we did in the hybrid app to be able to evolve and make this experience right. Okay? So is this first iteration going to be the perfect experience? No, you're going to expect this to change a lot over the next few months, but that's basically what we're providing. Let's say you went in here and you didn't have a migration endpoint. We would create the migration endpoint, uh, walk you through creation of migration endpoint for you. Um, and then once the migration is successful, we would show you a completed page um, that allows you to go and update your DNS records. The other thing we're doing in a new uh, migration experience, and this is for IMAP and MRS, is instead of whenever there's a, 
you want to start a migration, if you're missing a prerequisite, let's say you didn't license your user, or let's say you, um, you didn't select the user, or you didn't put the password in, or whatever you need to do for that migration approach, we, we're doing inline help rather than pushing you out to content. So when you click Start Migration, if you have uh, a missing prerequisite, we say, show me how to fix it. And then we have help bubbles that show up that will show you exactly what to do, step one, step two, step three, and step four, to be able to get past that error experience. Now, with this new hybrid app, we've been getting a lot of complaints. The complaints are, you know, the hybrid wizard's going to put me out of work. A lot of this comes from internal Microsoft employees. They're, they're really concerned because they're consultants for Exchange and they're, they're, you know, they do hybrid deployments. And we're, we're, we went from 40% failure rate to 1% failure rate on first run. So what are these guys going to do for work? The, the way I usually answer this is I tell them SharePoint, Skype, they're all hiring. <laughs> it's all good, right? There's, I even think there's a SharePoint session next door. Great, don't go. But anyway. Um, and then, you know, if you're not interested in those, um, how many people knew that we, um, we acquired LinkedIn? We acquired, anybody wondering why we acquired LinkedIn? What's that? Well, yeah, for all the exchange admins that are out of work. And we wanted a way to automate finding them new positions. So we created the new resume configuration wizard. <laughs> Let's connect. Anyway. I'll be the first one to use it. Um, <clears throat> so uh, shifting gears a little bit, uh, let's talk about uh, some of the issues you might encounter getting to hybrid. So the session this morning was about long-term coexistence and the issues that flow out of that long-term coexistence. These are the issues where I'm going to talk about some of the problems you might encounter just getting there, moving your users there. Um, I find this a really powerful quote uh, because it really applies to a lot of us, um, especially to me. Um, talking here about all the mistakes I've made, and hopefully by talking about them, I will allow you to avoid making them. So um, a question I get asked regularly is, uh, what version of Exchange should I use? And Nicholas covered it this morning. Um, I, I want to reiterate over that, because uh, today, basically, if you're on 2010, 2013, or 2016, you are good to go. Right? There are certain conditions where you might want to upgrade first or not, and there is some logic that applies. But consider that if you're on Exchange 2010, first question that you should ask yourself, am I happy today? If you are, great. Stay there. Nothing to do. Right? Just stay on 2010 and move on with whatever you need to do. If you're unhappy, then ask yourself a very important question. Why? Why are you unhappy? There can be many reasons. If it's unrelated, we'll fix those issues first. If it is related to your exchange appointment, then fix those issues first, which means if the Exchange 2010 server is underperforming, if you're having storage issues, if you're having god knows what issues, certificate issues, fix those problems first, right? If you did, then ask yourself another question. Why am I building a hybrid deployment? First of all, should you be deploying a hybrid deployment? Right? But let's assume that you have made the decision that you are going to go hybrid. Well, what is your purpose? If the purpose is long-term coexistence, then move the mailboxes to Office 365. So while you're in 2010, and then after you've moved the mailboxes to um, Office 365, then upgrade to 2013 or 2016. That's what I would do at that point in time. Alternatively, you could also just migrate them, move the mailboxes, and then upgrade to 2013 or 2016, provided that you're on 2010. If you're already on 2013, it doesn't really matter. Just use whatever is there. Now, there are scenarios where you might want to upgrade first, especially coming from 2010. It's a really important question to ask, because the upgrade from 2010 to 2013 um, is somewhat one that requires a lot of work, 
right? You just don't install an Exchange 2013 server and be done with it. There is the namespaces that you have to switch over, and you know, that in itself is additional work, um, which you know, may or may not incur additional pain for your end users. It mostly will. Um, so you want to avoid that. If your end goal is going to Office 365, then you don't want to cause additional work for yourself, right? So basically, in all but a few scenarios, the answer is move first, upgrade later, because the impact is almost non-existent. And we talked about that. Sizing. So just a quick question. Who thinks today he or she needs to do something specific to size a hybrid deployment? It's an open question. No one. OK, so these slides are in vain. I don't believe you. Um, but what I regularly encounter is that people have some sort of a deployment, 2, 4, 8, 16, 54 servers. They have a, a certain number of servers. They decide to go hybrid, and all of a sudden, it's panic. Oh, we're going to go hybrid. We need servers to do that hybrid thing. We need a hybrid server. Let me tell you, there is no such thing as a hybrid server. So they panic, and they're like, yeah, we need to build this massive thing that supports our hybrid deployment. Well, let me tell you, all you need is literally what you already have, provided that your on-premises environment is sized correctly, which means you know, if you've done your homework, you've you know, used a calculator, and you've ha you have enough servers with you know, the right amount of storage and processing power and memory and all that, you should be fine because you're not adding a workload. Well, technically you are, because if you're moving a mailbox, then sure, your servers are doing a little bit of extra work. But if you move a mailbox on premises, they do too. So you're not literally adding a lot of workload to those servers. Even more, if you move mailboxes to Office 365, you're alleviating the load on premises, which means you're doing less there. So you're not going to need more than what's already there. Um, so just keep in mind that if your on-prem environment is properly sized, you're good to go. Anyway, I want to talk to you about um, troubleshooting mailbox moves. Um, but before I do so, I want to reiterate over how these mailbox moves work and um, what the different you know, little tidbits are and the different um, components are that uh, include, are included in a mailbox move. So consider a scenario that you see on screen. You've got Office 365 in one end and uh, an on-premises environment in the other end. And um, if you create a mailbox move, whether it is through the EAC, whether you use PowerShell, whether you create a migration batch or di directly create a move request, it doesn't really matter, right? So the, uh, the administrator goes to Office 365 or goes to the on-premises EAC and then connects to the Office 365 portal. Um, it, it doesn't really matter. You create that migration batch, you create that move request, which instructs Office 365 to make an inbound connection into your environment. Now, it connects to whatever the, end, the egress point in your environment is, which could be a firewall, um, a load balancer. Uh, but basically, what it connects to is that migration endpoint. From there, the connection is forwarded to your client access servers, and uh, a virtual connection is established, and information is pulled from, Office 3, uh, from your on-premises environment. So um, in Exchange, there's two types of mailbox moves. There is a push move, and there is a pull move. The one to Office 365 is literally a pull move. So it's not your on-premises environment connecting to Office 365. It's the other way around. That's also one of the reasons why you need a public third-party certificate on the endpoint that is facing the internet um, through which you're going to migrate mailboxes, right? So at that point in time, you create the mailbox move. It connects into the on-premises environment. It will move the mailbox. And once the mailbox is moved to Office 365, the recipient that just has been moved will be changed from a mailbox user to a mail-enabled user to allow coexistence and so forth and so on. Pretty straightforward. What I'm going to focus on next is that migration endpoint, that virtual thing, uh, which is literally called a migration endpoint in Office 365, um, and all the things that surround that. So um, the migration endpoints are, as I said, the, the way how you publish those Exchange servers to the internet, which typically is nothing different from how you publish Outlook Web App. It's the same endpoint. Um, this morning during the presentation, there was a, a talk about uh, hybrid namespaces, whether you need an additional namespace. You do not. You just reuse what's already there, right? Um, there are some cases where we might need additional endpoints, and we're going to talk about that right now. But today, assuming that the endpoint is the same as the one that you use for Outlook Web App, great. Um, connects there. 
Um, the HTW does create the, uh, the endpoint automatically. Uh, depending on your environment, it might fail. Uh, this is part of feedback uh, that you might actually see is that during the hybrid configuration wizard, one of the things it does is it enables the MRS um, proxy on the client access servers. If you enable the MRS proxy and you try doing a mailbox move like two minutes later, chances are that it will not work because you know, it needs time to activate. And if you do an IIS reset, actually it works. So um, if you run the HEW and move a mailbox directly, chances are the endpoint hasn't been created or is not working yet. But assuming that it is there, you can use that. Um, we can create additional endpoints, and that is going to be really important in, in what I'm going to talk about next. Now, when we're publishing Exchange for Hybrid, considering there is such a thing that you can publish Exchange for Hybrid, then um, you want to reuse what you have today. Uh, ever since Exchange 2010, we've been accustomed to using load balancers to publish the Exchange workload to, all, to the internet. And depending on the version that you're working with, you need affinity, you didn't need affinity, you can just use, you know, uh, without affinity that every connection goes to a different server and so forth and so on. Now, the problem there is, um, if you've got a 2013 or 2016 array of servers sitting behind a load balancer without any form of affinity, then one connection goes to the load balancer. It's directed to server A. And the, sec uh, the, the, the second connection that comes in is directed to server B. And the third is to server C and so forth and so on. So it you know, kind of moves all over the place. And the result of that connection moving can actually slow down a mailbox move, but it also makes that connectivity a lot less predictable. Right? You know it's hitting your endpoint, but once it hits your endpoint, it could hit any of the servers behind that endpoint. Um, that in itself is it's not really a problem, but makes troubleshooting a little bit more uh, difficult, uh, more time consuming, uh, and often requires you to, during the troubleshooting of a mailbox move, go into the load balancer, you know, disable two or three servers from the array, or make sure that you know, connection doesn't go to the, those servers in order to rule out a problem with the load balancer or the server itself. Um, and it only adds more complexity because if you're not the one owning that piece, if you're not the one owning the proxy serve or the reverse proxy or the load balancer or the networking gear, it means that you'll have to work with the networking team, and we all know how, that, how well that works, right? Um, so it makes your life a little bit more difficult, and the flow is unpredictable. So if you can avoid that, then that is a good thing. And that's when we end up in a situation where you could have multiple endpoints. Um, so by default, one endpoint is created. Um, assuming that it's mail.mydomain.com, mail.contezo.com, that is your first endpoint. And what you could do is, in the load balancer, tell that endpoint only to use a single exchange server in the back so that when it hits that endpoint, it goes to a single client access server. Um, and then you can create a second migration endpoint and then define that second migration endpoint for a different migration batch which means that you know batch one is connected to the first migration endpoint and batch two is connected to the second migration endpoint, which makes your life a lot easier. Plus, um, as we will see later, it will improve your migration experience and the speed of the migrations of the mailbox moves. The downside is that you might actually need additional IP addresses depending on your network configuration, public facing IP addresses. And given that we're all running out of these you know, IP addresses, unless you're using IPv6, um, it could be a little bit challenging. So it's a little bit more work on the networking side, but it does make your life a lot, a lot better from an end user experience. Now, in, in this kind of configuration, it also applies to previous configuration where you've got that load balancer that uh, takes care of uh, connecting traffic to the backend servers. Um, there are additional things that you need to take care of. Um, for instance, timeouts on the devices, networking timeouts on the devices. You have to make sure that they match end to end. Well, not really match, but you have to make sure that there is a cascade of those timeouts so that you don't have you know, a connection being dropped by the load balancer before it's being dropped by the exchange server. right? Um, or you know, if there is a firewall in between, you don't want the firewall to cut off a network connection if the load balancer doesn't do that. right? So typically, it's the lowest timeout, the furthest away that you want to have it configured. MTU sizes, we were having a, an interesting discussion the other day. Um, need to make sure that everything lines up from a networking perspective as well. It's not that adding a migration endpoint will solve those problems, but those are things that you need to keep in, in mind when publishing Exchange in general, but especially if you're going to do mailbox moves, because a mailbox move in itself is you know, quite a heavy payload, especially considering you're moving gigabytes and gigabytes of data through that uh, connection. Now, um, another thing that, that I 
face a lot is that when we talk to the security team, which may or may not own the firewalls, they're like, yeah, you know what? Um, we're, we're not really ready to open up the firewall. Or you know, the recommendation is you know, open up the firewall to specific domain names, you know, Microsoft domains from Office 365. And then typically, you'll, you know, nine times out of 10, you'll get the answer, well, our firewalls don't support that. <laughs> so we can only do IP-based exceptions uh, to allow a connection into our environment. Well, um, we've added for reference the RSS feed that publishes all the IP addresses that are in use by Office 365. The problem is, if you do it on an IP base, um, you have to maintain those ACLs on the devices themselves, which is a pain. If you're managing the firewalls, it's a pain for you. If you don't manage the firewalls, we'll be happy because it's someone else's problem. But it is a problem. It's not that they change very often, but um, what you'll get is that today something will work and tomorrow it won't work because a new IP address is there or something has changed. And it's not really the first thing you think about when a move fails, that maybe the firewall is dropping the connection. But we'll, we'll get into that in just a little bit. So let's take a, a, an, an example scenario. Um, you've set up this hybrid. You're a happy camper, or as Nick would say, happy as a pig in mud. Um, and uh, you're ready to start moving a mailbox to Office 365, but you just figured out, ah, I created the move, and it isn't even starting. So you know, Friday afternoon, ha, ah, this isn't funny. So what do you do, right? So the first thing that you need to do is understand, is this migration endpoint working at all? Right? I'm hitting something, but am I getting to the Exchange server? Um, and the easiest way to do that, I'm very happy that Microsoft created this commandlet, is using the test migration server availability commandlet. Um, you connect to Exchange Online PowerShell, run this commandlet, point it to your endpoint, your migration endpoint that you have specified in the migration batch, and then see what it comes up with. In some cases, you'll get this error. And there is a lot of errors that you might get. For instance, connection to the server, um, and in this case, this is one of my labs, could not be created, a whole lot of information. And then especially the last sentence is important in this case. Um, it says, the remote certificate is invalid according to the validation procedure. Well, literally, it just told you what the problem is. I tried hitting that endpoint, but I could not verify the certificate that I was connecting to. Either the certificate expired, in this case it did expire, or you didn't use a third party certificate, um, as we mentioned before. So that this is the inbound connection that we were talking about. So that is definitely the first step that you need to do, kind of understand what's going on. Maybe this will work. Maybe this will tell you, yes, I was able to con connect successfully, which makes it harder. Um, but that's when we get into the other steps, right? So some of the common causes for the failure that we had is the one that you can see on screen. The service wasn't able to connect using the credentials provider, provided please check the credentials at, uh, and try again. Typically, it's a 401 somewhere in that error message that you will see as well. Um, well, a migration endpoint is not just an endpoint that is published on your firewall. It also has a credential attached to it once you create that uh, migration batch. And, um, if you are a little bit security conscious, you're, you know, especially these types of credentials, they are going to expire at some point. If that happens, then this is the error message that you're going to see. So if that you know, is the case, then you have to update your migration endpoint with new credentials. And once they are updated, then try the test migration server availability command again, and you should be fine. Connectivity issues. Maybe. The firewall does accept a connection, but isn't able to pass it on to the load balancer or the reverse proxy or even the exchange servers. So how do you go about that? How do you know it's hitting the exchange servers? Well, it's really simple. You take a look at the connectivity logs. Well, depending on the version of exchange that you're at, it could be the IIS logs in 2010. It could be the HTTP proxy logs in 2013, 2016. Um, but what you typically want to do, and that's why it's important that you can single out that one server that you know the traffic is trying to hit that server, because then you can go to those logs on that server, verify if you can see an incoming connection for, um, for the MRS proxy endpoint, and then figure out whether or not the, the connection is actually getting to the exchange server in the first place. So these are some basic steps and basic issues. And then the expired certificate problem is the one that we uh, saw before. We've gone through the motions. We've been able to start a mailbox move. Yay, ready to go to weekend. And then all of a sudden, you notice that halfway through the mailbox migration, it fails. Crap. Again, another problem. So what are we going to do now? It started, but it failed. Well, first, 
Don't panic. It's OK. It can fail. It will fail. At some point, all mailbox will, not all, but you, you'll encounter a mailbox move that will fail. Because there's many reasons they can fail. Um, the best piece of information I can give you is use the move request details. So even if you created a migration batch, what the service will do for you is create these move requests uh, that you know, are part of the migration batch. Each move request, uh, or for each user, there is a move request. And in that move request, there are move request statistics. So using this commandlet um, and all the switches that include report, diagnostic, and the verbose switch, uh, what you will get is a lot of insight into what happened during that mailbox move, whether it completed or failed, and so forth and so on. So you take that information, you save it as a variable, you save it in an XML file, you put it in a CSV file, everything is fine, right? In this uh, scenario, we put it in a um, variable. And then you take a look at what's stored in that variable. Is there some useful information, something that could hint towards what is wrong with that mailbox move? For instance, the uh, property failure type might actually tell you something. In this case, it says, too many bad items, permanent exception. It's a really long word, but it's you know, self-explanatory. So we had a mailbox move. It failed because there were too many bad items that it encountered. OK. Well, there's two things that you can do. You can either try and figure out why, or you can be the lazy guy and just increase the bad item limit and try again, right? I like the second option. I mean, you know, by default, it has a certain value. I think it's 10. Increase it to 20, 25, and try again. And if it fails again, then increase it to 50 and try again. And, uh, you get the picture, right? No, um, no, but at no. some point, you'll have too many bad items and you know, too many, one too many, that you're noticing, well, this isn't going really well, and I don't want to increase it to a million, so let's figure out what happens here. So using this script, um, and again, I'm not going to go through the script. Uh, it's not really a script. It's a one-liner, if you will. Uh, but you're basically going into the move details. You're going into the report, and the report part of that uh, move request statistics has a lot of information. In this case, we're taking a look at the failures that happened, and we're asking the service, OK, so now give me all the failures that you encountered during this mailbox move. List it in, it, uh, in a table that is humanly readable, and then you can go through there. So as you can see, this particular move request had a lot of failures you know, uh, that it couldn't do. Uh, for instance, folder save exception is the first one that we encountered, and a, a lot of or, uh, other exceptions that it encountered along the way. At some point, it might reveal something for you, or it might just be gibberish that doesn't tell you a lot. Most of the cases, though, it'll give a hint, something that tells you, OK, I need to explore this. Now, if you take a look at the move, uh, the move details, in this um, case, the um, move request statistics, there are other properties. So we had the failure details before. You can get the last failure. Really great way to start with, because that's typically the one that costs oh, a move to fail. Sorry. For instance, if you take the last failure, that's the minus one in square brackets here, it does tell you, OK, so the too many bad items, uh, it tells you the mailbox exceeded the maximum item of corrupted items. We already know that, of course. Um, but it might tell you something else. You can actually take that information, so you know it's about bad items, and then go to the bad item property and get all the information out of that attribute. In this case, it will literally tell you what the bad items are. So if you've got 10 items that are bad, you can take a look and understand which ones it are. So you can maybe open up the mailbox, take them out, leave them in, increase the size, do something about them, and then try the mailbox move again. Right? Take the appropriate action for that. Um, the bad items here, it also applies to the large items. You can do that for both. So instead of bad items, you just replace that with large items, and you know which items are too large. Um, because they might not fit in the Office 365 service limit. OK, great. Then export them out of the mailbox, put them into a PSD. Don't do that. Um, and then you know, know that you cannot inject them. This one is one of my favorites. How many times have you moved a mailbox and someone came to you and said, I don't have all my emails in there? It happens. First of all, my de facto answer is, well, which one? And typically, they'll tell you, well, I don't know. Well, using this commandlet, what you can do is literally verify source and target environments, right? Verify how many items were in the source environment, how many are now in the target. 
and get that information, which, you know, in retrospective, you can just show them, be like, yeah, but it did move everything over, right? There's always, you know, a few items that are left behind or didn't migrate, but at least it'll be the same amount of numbers that you move. Uh, if you see 100 uh, items in the source, and only two items in a target, something went wrong, believe me. Or your bad item limit was just too, too, uh, set to a too high value. Anyway, um, wow, time's moving quickly, isn't it? Um, time is moving faster than the mailbox moves. <laughs> um, so my mailbox moves are to Office 365 are slow. Never had that experience? Who has had that experience? Yeah. That's what I, what I figured. Um, it, it happens. Um, let me break the news to you. It's you. <laughs> really, it is you. Um, nine times out of 10, it is you. Something on your end. Um, so when you take a look at the migration performance, what could possibly go wrong? Well, there's a few things that influence migration speed. So from the things that could negatively influence the migration performance, the item count. It's like moving files on a, on a disk. One large file copy is quicker than a lot of smaller files. So if you've got a big mailbox with a lot of tiny little items in there, it's probably going to take a lot longer than a same-sized mailbox with a single large item. All things considered, you know, if 150 megs is the limit, then you, know, you see where I'm going with this. But a million small items takes longer. Firewalls. You've got these fancy new, well, not that new anymore, firewalls that do deep packet inspection and God knows what other trickery on the traffic that flows through. And you know, you've got one gig internet connection and 10 megs coming out of the firewall into your network. Well, you know, that might actually slow down um, a move. You might just have undersized exchange servers. You shouldn't have, because if you've listened to Brian's sessions about the mailbox calculator and you've done it correctly, you should have the performance you need. But if you're running you know, a virtualized exchange environment and it's running uh, on a SAN, which is really, really slow, which you shouldn't do, um, then you can get that sort of issue. Network latency on your end, whatever it is, there's a lot of variables that come into play that could actually influence that as well. And workload ma management on the Office 365 side, also on premises, though. Um, so those can negatively influence the speed. There are some things that can actually increase the speed multiple mailbox move or concurrent moves. So if you create two migration batches to through different migration endpoints to two different servers, the oh. overall throughput of your migration, sorry, is going to be faster than if you've got a single move with 10 mailboxes. So two moves or separate move batches with five mailboxes is going to complete faster as a single with 10 mailboxes, generally, though. And how you publish exchange uh, to the internet also has an influence. Keep it simple. If you do it simple, it's probably going to end up being faster than if you go through a million and one hoops to get to those servers. Anyway, on average, what you can expect is anywhere between 200 megs to a gigabyte an hour for a mailbox. But if you've only got a 10 meg internet connection, that's probably going to be the limiting factor right then, right there. Right? So there is an, an entire string of things that come into play. How do you troubleshoot a slow mailbox move? Well, first of all, don't panic. It's OK. We can solve this problem. Then get from that move details that we had earlier. Get the session statistics or the move request statistics, and then take a look at the session statistics of that move request. You'll get a bit of information about the, you know, the, the actual speed or the actual latency. You'll get the average latency, the minimum and the maximum latency. And one thing that you, know, you might encounter is you know, that if your average latency is above 500 milliseconds, that's when there is something wrong. Anything under that is acceptable. Lower is better, of course, but you know, consider something to inspect or you know, take a look at once it goes beyond 500 milliseconds. Number one question, am I being throttled? No. <laughs> Maybe. Probably not. Um, so the reason for that is Microsoft doesn't throttle bandwidth, right? If there is some slowness, as I mentioned earlier, it is nine times out of 10, it is you. There are some other things that might impact that, but the throttling policy, what most people are referring to, I've heard customers come to me and be like, yeah, we need to go to support and ask them to raise our throttling policies in Office 365. It will have no impact to your mailbox move at all. 
because it does, simply doesn't intervene, it doesn't apply to that move in itself. I'm sure that you know, Tim can you know, tell some stories there, but it doesn't, right? So make sure that you, you take a look at that and that you cover those basics. Um, so what can you do about it? What can you do about the slow, uh, slowness? Well, sometimes you just can't. Slow internet connection will upgrade, of course. But if you're in a remote area somewhere, in a really, really remote location where you can only, uh, who, who said it the other day that bounces off internet connections off the sea? Um, yeah. There's only so much you can do, right? I mean, you know, it is what it is. Um, there are some times that we, when you go and take a look at the session statistics or the, uh, the migration statistics of the, of the move, that you can see that a mailbox move stalls or is stalling multiple times. And there are sometimes, it doesn't happen very often. I, I, to be honest, it, it's been quite a while I've seen one of these myself. But sometimes you're stalled because of a condition in the Office 365, because of high availability, content indexing, and so forth and so on. That is a good thing because it's Microsoft protecting its service or protecting you know, its service from you so that you do not kill the service for other people. Right? So you hope that it happens as well if someone else is moving so that you don't get any negative influence. But those are conditions that happen sometimes. Typically, they happen and they go away by themselves. So if you see a stalled mailbox move, what I tell people, relax, wait, and see what happens. If it fails, then you know, take a look at it again and see if there's something you can do. There are other things that you can do something about. For instance, increase the export buffer size. Now, what do I mean by that on the exchange side? Um, by increasing the export size, and it's only 2013, 2016, you will actually reduce the amount of calls that Office 365 makes into your environment, basically increasing the payload per packet that goes through to Office 365, which can improve the performance. I'm not a big fan of proactively changing things. If you move to Office 365 and you're happy with the move experience, great, keep it that way. If you're experiencing slowness, then start tweaking one thing at a time till you get to a level of performance that you're happy with. Check all the conditions. Scale out your on-premises environment if needed be. Um, so that goes in against the sizing thing that I said earlier, but it kind of reflects to bad sizing, gar garbage you know, source environment to start with. Fix that first, so that shouldn't be a problem later on when you're moving, and check the network connectivity. For those who are interested or are migrating or are experiencing a lot of information, uh, a lot of issues during a mailbox move, there is a really, really good article uh, on the MS Exchange team blog website um, that has a lot of detailed information about the troubleshooting steps you can go through. It contains a lot of the same information that we just you know, disclosed here, but it can really be an article that you can use to go through everything and uh, see what you can do about that. So this being said, we are at the end of our session. So um, yeah, so basically, in conclusion, the uh, good job giving all those tips and tricks. And hopefully, people listen to some of them and not all of them. Um, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hybrid. <laughs> Hybrid's been updated. We got new end-to-end -end experiences coming, OK? Uh, if you want improvements in your experiences, your onboarding experiences, your hybrid, your migration experiences, give us feedback. You might get an honorable mention if you're good at writing. Um, <clears throat> migrations are hard and they break, so follow the rules. Okay? If you follow the rules that, that, that were laid out for you, they'll go well, and feedback is key. Um, if you, um, you want to follow up with anything, I know I'll be at the booth later today. I don't know if you'll, you'll be there I'll as well. I'll hang around as well. And I'll be at the booth, uh, the Exchange slash Outlook booth, uh, a lot tomorrow as well. And there's a support supportability session that I'll be in tomorrow as well. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you.